David and Fred a moment to reflect back on James and Allison's very, very rich comments. I, I don't think you'll be able to answer every single question they posed to you, but if you'd like to have a couple of minutes before we open things up. I mean, maybe just a sort of uh, a reflection back in terms of sort of tone. I mean, I, 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 th I don't think we've settled all questions. Um, there are a, a, a number of very important left hanging, important questions left hanging out as a result of this. And uh, I, I, mean, I mean, I don't think we should apologize for that. I, I, I think that uh, if we have questions both for further research and for the nitty gritty business of actually thinking about how we operationalize these things, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly unhappy about that. Um, it's true in the presentation we didn't emphasize this business of Africa needing transformation and not just growth, but I think I mean, that is a very common, a very important theme, and it's one that's common to all of the current research programs, I think, that they think that's important. Um, I mean, it, it, isn't, it, it isn't just that we maintain that the current growth is all China-driven. We actually don't say that. Um, just it is clear that, 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 that that's not the case. But uh <coughs> I think, I mean, if you could put it in one way, I mean, the, the, the worry is that uh, um, Africa is going to get um, a, a kind of economic development um, rather similar to what Latin America had in the first half of the 20th century, shall we say. I mean, th there'll be economic growth. There will be an exploding middle class. There will be urbanization. But there'll also be growing inequality, persistent poverty in the rural areas. And you won't have any of the things that successful Asian, particularly East East and Southeast Asian countries have, have, have got over the, over the past period. And that maybe is the thing that Africa most needs. It needs rural transformation, um, which is a, 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 a proposition which is very strongly supported by the Dutch program on, on tracking development, which compares Africa and Southeast Asian countries. On the sort of technical question of whether it's wise to completely chuck out principal agent analysis, I, I mean, I don't think we do want to completely chuck it out. It's a question of which one is nested in terms of the uh, uh, of which, I think. And the, you, you could say that the conventional wisdom on governments for the last 20 years ha, ha, has, has been that the fundamental thing is one kind or another of principal agent um, uh, problem, and you discuss collective action problems in a sort of limited way in that context. That needs to be reversed, I think, so that the, the the, the big problem is, to, is that actors of all kinds have difficulty actually pursuing their own interests and doing the thing that you would think would be the obvious thing for them to do. Um, and occasionally, um, actors do manage to um, get themselves in a position where th they can work for their own interests, and, and then a principal agent problem arises. I mean that. It, it makes perfect sense to see the functioning of the Rwandan civil service currently as pr primarily a principal agent problem. But I mean, that is because we're dealing with a rather unusual regime in which there is a, 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 a rather sort of dis a robust l elite discipline and a decision to uh, um, pursue a, a, a more than short term objective. Two, we should have referenced the um, crisis state research. <laughs> much more than we did, um, because it's entire <laughs> in, in, entirely consistent uh, um, with uh, the, uh, the synthesis report that, uh, that, that Dave recently um, uh, launched. And it's, it's partly because we're, we're two cracks. I mean, some, some, some of our best researchers <laughs> were your best researchers. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one thing I actually want to say about th this sort of central argument about needing to shift from principal agent perspectives to collective action perspectives. We're not the first people who thought of this. Um, but that idea occurred to me personally, reading the, the work of a, a rather good government center at Gothenburg in, in, uh, in Sweden um, that developed this idea specifically in relation to anti-corruption efforts. And the, argu the argument, which I find completely compelling, is that most standard anti-corruption efforts are based on unrealistic assumptions about anti-corruption <coughs> principles. Um, and that actually the reality is that both the people at the top and the people at the bottom who you might think were suffering from, 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 from corruption uh, actually don't find it easy to take even the first steps against corruption. 
and that that's what we should be trying to address. So, that, I mean, the realization was that that's not just true about anti-corruption, it's actually true about the whole gamut of, of, uh, of, of governance issues. So, we in that sense, we don't claim originality, but it's an idea that makes perfect sense and organizes a, l a lot of the empirical findings that we, we come up with. Excellent, thank you for that. Can we open up now for questions from the floor? I'm not quite sure how the best way to get microphones around to people, but just to spread them around. Spread them out. Spread them out. Okay, two or three more. Thanks very much. I mean, I, I think like many other people, I would really congratulate the authors of this of, of this work for something that uh, I think is a very very important development in, in the way in the way that one thinks about uh, the, co the core challenges of developing countries so I think it, it, it is a uh, it's a milestone it, it, it's a shaper of the landscape <coughs> uh, and I agree with a very great deal that is here I'd really just like to pick up one point at the end of the so what question which was raised by David. Um, and the argument that um, a key challenge is to convince ministers and publics and officials that it is these institutional questions with the collective action problems at their heart which are the center of the agenda and is not resources. I mean, I think um, I'd like to nuance that a bit because I think it is seems pretty clear from decades of experience that where you have institutions that are not fulfilling the key functions of whether it's defining public, uh, public good provision or addressing collective action problems, then throwing resources at those as many development agencies have done for a long period because that's why they exist um, and perhaps they're driven by agendas other than strictly developmental ones then that is certainly not going to deal with the problem. That is not a resource problem. But having said that, I think where there are situations where institution, the institutional framework is at least half performing, half functioning in terms of addressing some of the basic requirements of the development process, then I think it would be a major mistake to underplay the importance of resources being available in that kind of situation. I mean, in the end, you are dealing with countries which are very resource scarce, where particularly resources for some public functions, whether it's going to be the primary education system or the basic physical infrastructure of communications and transport, these are going to need resources. So let's not have an implication of this work being taken that resources fundamentally don't matter. Resources in the right context will continue, I think, to be very important. I'm Hubert Schmitz from IDS. Um, I don't work on Africa, uh, but uh, I came to this meeting because um, I like your seminars. They inspire me. <laughs> um, so I'm on your side. Um, it was very uh, good to hear Alison and James talking very eloquently about all the strengths of the work. I have um, two questions. The first one is uh, about the past. Um, the notion of working with the grain is one that struck a chord with many people. I've used it myself. But then um, you made the interesting point that it didn't lead to new policies and new initiatives. And uh, I'm wondering whether this is because the aid agencies became part of the grain. Um, I leave it there. <laughs> um, my second question is more about the future. Uh, thinking about all your interesting findings, uh, I think it would be very useful and interesting, certainly for me, and I believe also for, uh, for James, judging from the comments he made, it would be very useful to go through these and ask which of these are specific to Africa. Um, 
Now, aren't uh, a number of those conclusions uh, of relevance uh, to other parts of the world, even for Western Europe, uh, even for the UK? Um, this weekend's Economist uh, um, has an interesting book review on energy policy uh, of Dieter Helm. And he refers to the field of promoting renewable energy as the cesspit or an orgy of rent seekers. <laughs> now, when I read this, I was, uh, I was just reading, you know, your summary. And I thought, well, you know, what is it that you actually provide to this? And I think it is quite a lot because, you know, Helm actually analyzes quite a few mistakes of the problem. But I think he lacks the kind of uh, uh, collective action perspective that you that you bring to this. So I think this would be really interesting to see, you know, to what extent are these conclusions of yours limited to Africa and do they not go beyond this? Um, my final um, comment uh, refers to, um, um, I think Alison already made, uh, questioned you on the uh, emphasis on centralized rent management. Um, I know you have empirical reasons for uh, uh, speaking out in favor of centralized and against decentralized rent management. But uh, I wonder whether um, this uh, needs a, a wider discussion. Rent management is a difficult thing to do. Um, you can create too little rent. You can uh, uh, foster the wrong sectors, use the wrong instruments, uh, get captured by private, it's a very difficult thing to do. And uh, experimentation is very important. And where in a decentralized setting, it is much easier to experiment. And this observation comes very much from research I've done recently in, in Vietnam, where a lot of experimentation happens at the, uh, at the provincial level. And then the central government picks up some of these uh, uh, um, lessons from, from, from the provinces and punishes, you know, uh, uh, the provincial leaders in, in those cases, you know, that didn't work well. But this whole notion of, of having to experiment, having to learn is much easier in a decentralized setting than in a centralized setting. And I think I'll leave it at there, but just to say I really enjoyed uh, uh, your work and uh, I want to learn more. Thank you. Uh, can I have the mic? Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Thomas. I'm a retired development worker. The reason I grabbed the mic is that I find myself not for the first time offering some historical context in this. I'm the guy that wrote the terms of reference against which the ODI did, made this bid, and I have to say I am here because I have been impressed by the work and I'm delighted to see some friendly old faces and I'm delighted to see the new generation of development workers. Let me explain why this is about Africa, because it was, there was too much scattergun research done by people that had a graduate student in Sao Paulo and thought, well, how nice if he did a bit of research for us. The idea of asking some prior questions, not with received opinions from the World Bank, the idea of getting social scientists other than economists involved was that already people like me were getting fed up with uh, Paul Collier producing answers and then getting somebody to fund the questions. Um, <laughs> we were very keen to, to not have too many economists because any profession that believes that man is rational and that markets work needs to seriously look at its uh, basic premises. So the idea of this research was to do basic political science research in Africa. Not, it didn't have to be Africa, it was just that there was so little of it that seemed to make sense, and digging deeper without preconception into some of the, uh, and almost going back to some of the behavioral work of the 1960s to say, does this still apply? Have we overladen what's going on in development research with long words and clever concepts which do not apply? And I commend the team for doing that extremely well. I commend some of the case studies for being solidly designed, looking carefully at what happened. We talked a lot in the early days about mid-level theory. The idea was to produce ideas that would work and move the development agenda on in a way that ministers, politicians, development workers, agencies could not say this is all, all very well, perfectly nice, but we're going to carry on as we are. 
what we do not yet know as to whether some of these new ideas will have any impact on the workings of the development agencies. What we do know is that the money is rising and staff capacity and numbers are declining. So that doesn't sound terribly good to start with. What we also know, of course, is that in certain development subjects, and the one I'm, my favorite one, is decentralization. I did work on decentralization in the 60s. We, DFID, funded decentralization work in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And there was at least one person I know we funded three times to revisit his views on decentralization in Uganda. And each time he came with the same conclusion, which was that it didn't work. And so we kept saying, good heavens, go back until you get the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope very much that the, some of the ideas, the answers, the thoughts, and the well-grounded views that you've come up with will be sufficiently robust that you won't be sent back to get the right answer. If, of course, you are, then the new generation of researchers will continue to stay employed. But it would be nice to get some other result. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Carlos Oya from SOAS. Um, I have a couple of comments and, and two questions. But first, I would like to join in the congratulations for the team. I have uh, uh, indeed um, enjoyed the reading of the policy briefs of the years, and, and I've followed up on, on progress in this research. And I think even if the core findings and, and, and the research itself might not be entirely original, as been said, it was certainly much needed. Um, it does contribute to, to an agenda, that, that a critical agenda that is, that is necessary nowadays. Um, let me just make a couple of comments. For, I mean, first, I would like to join James in, in the call to drop neopatrimonialism once for all. Um, you've shown that it's not a, ve not a very helpful analytical cate category. It's not a helpful empirical category. Let's just not use it. Um, and I think you have several other empirical and uh, conceptual categories which are much more useful in terms of understanding some of the key questions and problems. Um, my second comment has been so sparked by Alison's comment, and I think I would agree that, um, and, and it's partly in relation to uh, the issue of bringing back uh, the problem of economic transformation and structural change into, into the agenda, into the, in this particular research. Uh, I I agree that there has been some economic transformation in this you know, sort of bonanza period of the post-2000. Um, I'm not sure it's the right type of structural change, in the sense that while on the one hand it's undeniable that commodity dependence has been reinforced, when you actually see instances of structural change, what you see is the rise of things like finance, i.e. reflection of financialization of some African economies, which is quite remarkable and quite striking in many ways, or other sectors like real estate, construction, or telecoms. Is this the right structural change? And I think that brings me to, to a question that my colleague Musa Khan has been analyzing over the years in this, in this type of, 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 of research problems, <coughs> which is the political economy of rent management for technological catching up and in, in relation to structural change, which is a basic problem in capitalist development. So I'm not sure whether this kind of structural change is, is the right type of structural change. And I think it would be good if this program focused a little bit more, maybe for the future, in understanding the conditions and the drivers of this type of structural change, what sorts of rent coalitions are driving this kind of wrong, what I would say wrong kind of structural change. So let me finish with two concrete questions. Um, one is how you deal with or how do you uh, uh, grapple with the, the, the issue of time horizons, different time horizons, affecting different problems and, and uh, as the ones you've analyzed. I mean, some of the issues have a very, very long time frame, you know, have th certain things that can be reformed and transformed, and others are much more sort of medium-term problems. So when you apply this particular analytical framework, what are the challenges that you faced in dealing with very, very different time horizons? And the second thing, the second question relates to your dialogue with the development business or industry. Um, and it's how you address the, the entrenched and deep-rooted ideological premises and preferences of development practitioners. And, and in a way, I mean, you've said this before, it seems to be that you know, the programs don't seem to change. Well, that probably reflects ideology. So, uh, and that's a huge challenge for any research program, actually dealing with ideology.
I'm sorry, I have to take, I have to go a little bit back to a question that Alison posed before, which was how you recognize um, a context that's amenable to local problem solving FUCs. <coughs> um, I would like to suggest that, um, at least in the, in, in the context of this work, that the report that Vicky and I wrote on, the, on maternal health care in Rwanda is a very, very thick description of what happens at the local level. And it shows you how the context works. Now, I remember, and, and, and James, uh, we remember this clearly. In, in the early 1990s, when decentralization was the rage, decentralization and empowerment of local communities, I was arguing very strongly against those ideas. Now, they were still very new. My argument against them was based on my knowledge of the society I came from. And my argument was always the society I was born in doesn't work like that. <coughs> and these things are never going to work. Now, I wrote a thesis, a PhD thesis at LSE, and my supervisor then told me, I'm sorry for you, you're swimming against the tide. But I did swim against the tide. And several years down the road, we all agree the ideas didn't work. Now, why did they not work? They didn't fit local realities. I was born in Uganda, and I live there. I spent part of my time in Rwanda. Now, the Uganda government is terribly incompetent. My neighborhood in Kampala is filthy. There is no cleaning up. Kampala City Council doesn't clean up. There is no local action to clean up. My neighborhood in Kigali is very clean. Now, we do the cleaning, and we don't choose to clean. We clean because the government says so, and because the local leaders enforce the rules. Now, most people who come to Rwanda, when they look at the Rwandan context, what do they see? A terrible dictatorship that's making people's lives very difficult. And, oh, isn't it terrible that you have a fascist government in Rwanda? They come to Uganda, they like Uganda very, very much because in Uganda no one enforces any rules. Now, this is a very good example. People coming into a context that works and refusing to see what works because they came with ideological baggage in their heads. The same thing applies to, if you go to Rwanda, they, the government fines people heavily for infractions of every kind. If you don't deliver at a hospital or a health unit, they will fine you in order to force you to go and do that. In Uganda, that's what the, ro the, the, the law says. Nobody does it. The enforcers do not do their job. What do people see when they come to Rwanda? Dictatorship. What do they do when, when do, what do they see when they go to Uganda? A nice government that respects people's rights. Yes, you can recognize a context that works if that's what you're looking for. If you're looking for something else, if, you, if, if you're blinded by ideology, you will, you will not see it. To elaborate a little bit more on that theme of what's, I mean, what's, what's the mechanism that links a fairly sort of strong top-down drive to the idea of local problem solving? I mean, putting it in more, in more abstract terms, it, it's that the, the, the sort of poor, low-status people at the bottom of the pile they don't, and this was the theme of, of, of Fred's uh, thesis work, actually, but they don't have the social competence to start ma de making demands on nurses, not to speak of doctors, um, and they face collective action problems. I mean, if, 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 if they make a complaint, they have no confidence that their fellows will actually back them up. They, 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 they stand a strong chance of actually su suffering a penalty um, of, a, of a fairly serious kind and getting worse services <laughs> and, uh, as a consequence, um, in, in in most sub-Saharan African countries, such people have no confidence whatsoever that the people at the top are, 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 are interested in, 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 in backing them up. If you get a situation where the person at the top actually is actively taking an interest in these things, then the small, humble people can sometimes raise their voice and get something done about it without suffering a consequence. And we don't have very, I mean, it would be lovely to have lots of examples of, this, of that mechanism working. We don't have very many of them, and some of them are historical. 
and they go back to the period when Dr. Banda used to travel around, as colonial district officers used to do, to villages mm -hmm. and create conditions in which small people could raise their voice um, with a sense that they're being supported from the top uh, and, th and therefore not get, got, get penalized for it. I mean, that's, that's the mechanism, I think. A bit of authoritarianism actually is, stimulates a little bit of, 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 of grassroots shouting in, in, in that sense. But um, our local problem solving is not just about small people complaining about big people. It's, it's also about the kind of uh, episode that's, that's documented uh, in our study uh, uh, in Niger in the, in the health sector, where a group of um, uh, district level officials, uh, chiefs, and members of health management committees got together and found a solution to a really serious problem, which was blocking the improvement in, 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 in maternal health. Um, collective action by a heterogeneous group of people uh, at the sort of middle range, including government people and non-government people, uh, who found a solution to a problem. And what was unpropitious about the context for problem solving in this case was that the Ministry of Health decided to um, take an extremely sort of mechanical view of its um, user charge exemption policy and say, you can't do this because it, 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 it infringes the policy. Um, a more propitious environment would be one where the government is led by people who are interested in the outcomes and who can recognize a, a, a solution to a problem when they, when they see it and, and make a decision to allow it to continue. Because there was a real solution to a real problem there. And the, uh, because the Ministry of Health took this mechanical view of, 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 of policy, we're actually back in a situation in, in Niger where uh, there are hippic ambulances in villages, but if you want to use them, you have to pay the fuel and you have to pay the drivers and you have to pay the security man, which means that the poor people just die. So I would love to have more examples of that kind. The problem is that there probably aren't that many good examples out there, but the mechanism, I think, is, 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 is clear enough. If you, have, if you have drive from the top, which is really about improving outcomes for a strong political reason, you may just get a situation where people will be able to solve problems and, and, and the problems and the solutions will actually survive. Um, can I go back to some of Hubert's uh, things? I mean, I, I think his Vietnam work is terribly, terribly interesting. Um, and it does indeed seem to represent a, 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 a case of decentralized rent management being quite, quite helpful. But I think I mean, there's, there's sort of two possible meanings of decentralization in this case. I mean, that, that's about local government units which have some autonomy to uh, uh, manage the rents that, that themselves. Our principal counterposition of styles of rent management in, involves the, uh, the sort of Ethiopian and Rwandan and, and, and Dr. Banda style on the one hand and current Tanzania or Uganda on the other hand, which is where decentralization really means free for all. I mean, perhaps we shouldn't use the word decentralization in, the, in, in this context. I mean, it's, it's, it's the management of rents as against chaotic free for all on rent. Or the DRC, indeed. Yes. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's a case perhaps where Let's go into that. But I mean, that's, that's free for all, isn't it? Yeah. Where, whether, whether the administrative structure is decentralized or not, it's still free for all. Yeah. Well, I've probably said enough at the moment, even if I haven't addressed everything. Oh, yeah, is this, are these kinds of concepts not relevant to UK energy policy? Absolutely. I mean, actually, these kinds of concepts have been used a lot on, on highly developed capitalist economies. I mean, there's, there's a whole industry of, uh, of, of this kind of institutional analysis and uh, collective choice, public choice analysis on, on, on advanced countries. And in a way, I mean, the, the, what, what's new here is we're, we're suggesting that that kind of sophisticated analysis, which has been used for advanced capitalist economies, actually needs to be applied to, um, to incipiently capitalist, very poor economies as, as, as well, and, and that it's even more important 
I mean, in energy and, and environmental policy, the, the sort of the disjunction between the short term and the long term is very central. In poor countries, the development issue involves this disjunction between the short term and the long term, which is really, really central. Carlos, can you pass the... Thanks, Heather, and thanks, um, David and Fred. Let me start with a very brief um, comment. Um, a big thank you to David um, for um, the inspiration that he has provided for us all in the polit politics and, um, and governance program at ODI and probably beyond at ODI. In two ways, the dedication and the energy that David and the team has put in the research over the last four years that we have observed and learned from. And perhaps even most importantly, the fact that the richness of the data of this research is now for us uh, an incredible, incredibly useful basis for work going forward and taking forward some of those ideas in practice, which has very much energized us all in the last few years. So we're very thankful for the work that we've done with this program um, and for how much it has contributed to our development um, in the last few years. Um, I got some, an observation, and I, I actually think Alison Alice put you know, identified a couple of things that are really important in thinking about t taking these ideas forward. Both these ideas of this, this, the tight grip at the top with loosening the grip at the bottom and how do you kind of reconcile that, as well as the question about how do you recognize an enabling environment for collective action at the local level when you see one. I wonder whether this, maybe, there are, maybe it, it would be worth to separate out a little bit these two fundamental propositions in the report. What you say in the report about the importance of authority, of capacity to enforce, and of, a law of, of, of enlightened leadership, I think is very important and critically moves away from just a notion that is about that at the center and having you know, a, a national leader who can do that. But <laughs> your research points to the importance of understanding local chiefs, for example, and how some of the dynamics at the local level and how authorities enforce matter. I'm not that convinced that this idea that you need that kind of authority to, inf you know, to make collective action work. It may be that the reason why people clean the street is because of fines, because of enforcement of rules, but I wouldn't, I think Hubert is right when he says that there, are, there is a role for innovation there, for example, on how do you resolve some of those ac you know, collective action problems in different ways in different places. So I do wonder whether there might be scope for exploring, I, th I think these are two Im very important contributions to the research. I do wonder the extent to which there is a case to prove that the way that having that role of authority is one of the enablers that makes collective action problems being resolved. I think we need to work a bit more on what makes collective action problems tractable and what are the different avenues that one can explore to resolve them, of which authority and leadership is one. But I think it would be worth to open up a little bit that space. And I think there is a work for us to take forward this notion of collective action as a general proposition, and now that can help steer, you know, help find a different direction for development more generally. But I think authority is only, and leadership is only one mm. part of the story. Um, I just want to say very quickly, I, d I don't want to take up a lot more time, I've had my 10 minutes, but just, just in response to Carlos and, and and David, David's points about the sort of big transformation picture or, or lack of it in, African, in a number of African economies. I really worry um, that if uh, our response to change in Africa is that it's the wrong kind of change. I really worry about that narrative. And I think it's unhelpful as a backdrop to this work in particular to lead on that. Um, and I think it's much more in the spirit of this work to say it is changing, let's understand that better and let's be, have our eye clearly focused on how that change can ultimately make for better lives for the majority of Africans. It's absolutely right to say that the kind of pattern of, of growth and, and structural change that's underway is not reaching everybody by any means, but I would be very, very cautious about needing to use an argument that it's the wrong kind of structural change as the basis for this kind of argument. Uh, I, think that, I think that's potentially underselling the value of this work. Um, 
Just a second point, um, Fred, you're absolutely right about, I mean, I know enough about the Rwanda story and contrasting it with the Uganda story, which is where I did my own PhD work, to know some of these differences that you, you've outlined. I think my point about the enabling environment for local problem solving was, was really the sort of, I'm sort of curious about why you think it's worked so well in maternal health and not in other areas within Rwanda, for example. So I don't go outside of the Rwandan context, but why haven't we got such a transformation in the agricultural sector in Rwanda with this regard, for example? What is it that's different there about the conditions for local problem solving or this tight, loose strategy, as I've called it, that uh, has meant that change has not been forthcoming at a pace in the way it has in aspects of the health sector in Rwanda. Um, now, the report touches on that a little bit and sort of says, well, it's coming. <laughs> but I'm not entirely convinced that you've really teased out the differences. What is it that's a particularly um, a feature of the health sector in Rwanda? I have a hypothesis for you. I may be entirely wrong. But one of the hypotheses I would have is that the rents available in the health sector are much lower than they are in the agricultural sector making centralised management a much easier deal. Maybe we can discuss that later in more further. But anyway, that's my hypothesis. Thank you. One, one more in the front and then we'll go to Thank you. I'm uh, Paul from the Africa Development Institute. So we have a couple of quick follow-ups. Paul, well, we need to give you a mic so we can... Can you... Thank you. There we go. Uh, the first one is, a, I guess, a question about agency. And it's... Um, I suppose I might put it this way. You, you've sort of talked about the importance of leadership under the developmental regimes and the not so developmental regimes. If, if the other Fred had lived and he was now running the RPF rather than Paul Kagame, would Rwanda be where it is today? And similarly, if George Weyer had won election in Liberia instead of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, would Liberia be where it is today? Um, my, my second question is, just, is around Alison's point around um, sort of not throwing the uh, principal agent baby out with the bathwater. Um, I think this point that there's multiple interests in government is a really, really important one. And my observation um, from the work that we do is that often one of the challenges for, for donors is that they only ever interact with one bit of government. So if you're the health advisor, you interact with the Minister of Health. And if you're the kind of head of the agency, you'll mostly interact with the Minister of Finance. And that can very easily give the impression that you're, you're dealing with a unified thing called government and conceal all of the conflict that's going on. Um, and I think as a sort of simple measure, I wouldn't necessarily advocate lots more training in political science for donor um, professionals. I'd advocate a stint in a cabinet office in their home country where they would get used to the enormous amount of interagency conflict that is a de facto uh, reality of, of governing. Um, and my third question is around the, the energy sector, which has been touched on, but mostly in the context of the UK, and that feels like a, a shame because I think it's a really interesting sector to spend some time on, partly because it's so important to this transformation agenda, and partly because for me it's, it's one of the fascinating conundrums about Rwanda. So Rwanda has lifted 200,000 households out of poverty, it's halved maternal mortality and infant mortality, but the energy sector is still producing slightly less than the US manages to put in background air base in about three months. Why is that? I should respond to to, uh, to Carlos on, on on the ideology of the the, uh, of the development agencies and how how and if you handle that. Um, I mean, I think ideology is a problem in this area. I mean, it's particularly a problem uh, at the level of the political leadership of uh, of, of bilateral aid agencies because uh, most differed secretaries of state a and our current prime minister. I mean, are, are are gung ho about promoting exactly good governance uh, and, and, uh, um, and and free market economies, um, and uh, agencies like DFID. I mean, have to work under that kind of political leadership. I think that's a, that's a real problem. I'm not sure that governance advisors or even sort of health sector advisors within the development agencies are um, as ideologically blind and uh, uh, ideologically blinded as the political leadership are. And, that, and that's, it's to those people really that our argument is addressed. And I, I think governance advisors in, in DFID are, are ripe for this move towards more collective action oriented type of, uh, of, of working and, and, and less of the simple principal agent type of thing. And the hope is that they may sometimes be able to persuade their political bosses of this. 
very interesting. Yeah, um, just, just quickly, going back to the issue of uh, collective action, uh, might have, for me, based on the contexts that I know, I find it difficult to believe that you can have tight control at the top and loose control at the bottom and get things at the bottom to work. Or at least in Uganda, what you have is loose control bo at both ends. And in Rwanda, there is no loose control at the bottom. Tight control runs right through from the top to the bottom. There is no looseness, at, at least as far as I see it. Um, the issue about uh, Alison, yes, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss details <laughs> of a drink. But it, this, this is not just maternal health or health care as such. Now, I don't have the figures here, but I can give them to you. When the Rwanda government decided to introduce a system of nine-year basic education, they lacked classrooms, I think about 2,000 plus classrooms. And now they got those classrooms built within one year. A lot of the work was done by local communities. Now, what you see in health is what is happening in education. Now, I personally think that agriculture is moving in that direction. And very soon we'll be getting another incredible story of transformation in Rwanda in the agricultural sector. Now, the energy sector probably is not really amenable to these sorts of things. But what I know there is the government has introduced an energy saving stove. Now, this was introduced by the military. Somebody in the army came up with it. Now, when I was interviewing military officers, I got to learn that somebody had come up with this stove and that it had been disseminated very widely. I started asking people informally whether they knew about this stove and this stove is being used, and very many peasants know about it. They have actually composed songs about it. So this, this tight control and drive for change actually runs across many different sectors. It's not just um, health. The question of what would have happened if Re Fred Rujema had run Rwanda rather than Kagame, I think that even Rwandans speculate about it. Kagame, <coughs> Rujema was very different from Kagame. Was, Rijema was a Museven type. He was, very, he was a populist. He probably would never have approached things the way Kagame does. My own speculation would be that there probably would have been a fight and some, somebody would have won it. <coughs> the fight that we saw between the RPF and the old guard from the MRND and the other parties that were in Rwanda before the liberation that led to the exodus of many senior Hutu politicians I think that's probably what would have happened, but it's all speculation. <coughs> okay, yeah, we're certainly not opposed to the idea that, the, the, that there, is a, there are moments when uh, individual leadership actually make a huge difference between solving a problem and not solving it. Um, yeah, hi. Thanks. Um, I, I really uh, like this work, and I think it's a really welcome um, move away from a focus on <coughs> principal agent to um, collective action programs. But I was thinking about this and thinking that maybe you'd, you could go even further in your sort of push in the direction of collective action. Because even in what, what the move towards collective action really does is a focus on interest uh, and time horizons time horizons in the sense of moving from short-term to long-term time horizons, because that's really what collective action resolution is about. And um, a focus on interest, because the interest is what's leading people to work together. And I think you don't question enough where these interests come from, um, how these interests are actually shaped. You're assuming that people or actors within the organizations um, know what their interests are, or in some sense we are imputing some public interests to them. And I think from your own cases, there's uh, quite a lot of examples where interests are reshaped or rethought from doing actually something, taking action and realizing what the consequences are so you realize your interests, or through deliberative institutions. And I think it leads to the question that Alison posed, where do these en enlightened uh, um, 
you know, public officials come from, leaders come from, and this would be interesting to sort of mine the cases you already have to look for, um, for uh, examples of that. The other short point I wanted to make was, I, get, I got the sense feel, uh, reading the report that you know, collective action was in a some, if you resolved it, it, it was in some sense a benign win-win situation for everybody. And I think collective action can be in two types. One is win-win for the actors involved in acting collectively, but it could be against in a confrontational way for other sources of power. So maybe highlighting that. Thanks, and a grand, uh, great work. Congratulations. Um, I had two, two questions, which are more forward-looking. One is, uh, when you think about this development um, that's provided at arm's length, have you come across any examples of that you find that are particularly useful to keep in mind? Any particular programs or approaches that you think have been effective at uh, you know, cutting across or cutting the transaction costs for collective action? Um, paving the way for collective action of the sort that you talk about. And the second is a uh, more open in question, which is when you end up writing a synthesis report like this, you often reflect and say, oh, I wish I'd looked at this, I wish I'd looked at that. And I wondered what sorts of questions you have um, you know, put in the, in the margins and said, you know, A, I wish I'd looked at these things, and what sorts of questions you would like to see yourself looking at uh, going forward. My, my comment. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to give a brief reply on the collective action issue, so maybe I'll save that and see if there's any time when these other questions have been dealt with. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to follow up on this collective action um, issue because I agree with the comment uh, made over there and also what Marta was saying about what factors are important in facilitating collective action. Um, I was struck by the lack of analysis about the organizational elements that, that are essential for collective action, and I think James Pottrell uh, picked up on this, on the real importance of, say, political parties or other forms of organized um, existence to be able to, to propel collective action forward. And I was just wondering if you could comment a bit on that. Yeah, these have maybe helped to give us some uh, answers to, to Taylor Brown's question about what, what questions next, because uh, th these are indeed some of the fundamental questions. I mean, I, I, I think at the, at the elite level, the, the question of the role of political parties is, is fundamental, which is a conclusion of the crisis stage uh, um, uh, research, and it's a theme of, um, of, of Phil Kiefer's research at, at as well. Um, with the small Dutch grant that we have to, 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 to follow up on certain questions, I mean, one, one of the things we, we, we're looking at, and Tim Kelsall specifically is looking at, is uh, the, the issue of why it is that when there have been developmental leaderships in Africa, they, they've been short-lived and they haven't outlived the individual person um, who is associated with them. And in Asia, the solution to that problem has typically been, well, not in all cases, but in several cases, has been the existence of a party either a Marxist-Leninist party or some other kind of dominant party. So I, mean, I think that is, that is a big question for the future as regards elite-level collective action problems and their solution. Um, <coughs> examples... No, actually, the, the other thing, to responding to Anu a bit... Um, I mean, some, some of these issues, I think, have already been well worked by the different bits of the, of, of, of the IDS research, um, so we don't need to sort of do that again. Um, but one of the things that's, that's, that's new and I think very important is this book by, um, um, by Masuda Bano on, on, on Pakistan, um, which has as one of its central propositions a really sort of non-obvious um, 
generalization, which is that the, the leaders of self-help groups that work that, and that survive are actually often not enlightened in the sense of being selfless. Um, and that actually the reason why their leadership help, uh, does solve collective action problems on, a, on, on an ongoing basis is that their motivation is sort of social self-aggrandizement. It, it's the achievement of sort of status and recognition. It's not selfless. Um, and she argues that, I mean, donors need to recognize, uh, donors and, and, and NGOs with money um, need, need to recognize this because very often giving money to people who have that sort of leadership completely destroys their leadership and leads to the self-help um, coming, to, coming to an end because uh, uh, ordinary people understand that uh, the, the search for status um, and the search for a certain kind of social power is, is, is a sort of credible way in which people will provide honest leadership. And once those people start receiving money from the outside, the, that, cre that kind of credibility gets undermined and she generalizes self-help organizations that get external money lose their members. It's a really very important book. Um, so there, are those, there is that kind of existing literature about the conditions which favor collective action and favor the continuation of collective action, which I think we need to take into account. Examples of the arm's length thing. At the micro level, uh, there are, I think, already a lot of examples of of NGOs that have been given um, uh, aid money to undertake local accountability interventions, who in actual practice are working to resolve collective action problems at the local level, and are having some success with that. Um, the, the, the ODI team who worked with uh, um, plan in, 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 in Malawi recently found that actually the, 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 uh, uh, the interventions which were uh, theoretically based on, on, on the, uh <coughs> the use of citizen scorecards to enhance accountability um, were actually doing collective action problem resolution. But they couldn't call it that because their sponsors had hired them to, to do standard sort of social accountability stuff. SNV in Tanzania is in the same sort of business. Um, there's a recent blog on the World Bank governance site about an experience in, in Sierra Leone. Same thing. Um, interventions in the health sector um, are actually bringing together the health providers and the local communities to collectively solve a problem. They're not stimulating citizen demand for better services. In fact, they find stimulating citizen demand for better services is a good way of getting bad services. So there's a lot of that stuff out there. And the main step forward we could take at this point is to actually recognize what those groups are doing and start to build up a body of experience on what works in that sort of field. Then at a more macro level, and there are entities like Trademark East Africa, the Budget Strengthening Initiative hosted by ODI, and the uh, African Governance uh, I Initiative, which are using aid funds in more or less this sort of way, and I think achieving good results as a result of doing the facilitation work without any obligation to disperse large amounts of money. briefly comment on James's point about rail policy and to me that's one of the big questions I have at the end of this is that um, as somebody who's moved from international relations into development studies what really strikes you is the normative side of development and how it can be a straitjacket but it's probably something that binds us together as well in terms of academics and practitioners and one of the challenges I think of this research which is an important challenge but one that shouldn't be under stated is that it challenges that normative space. Um, so what do academics or development agencies that are committed to development in a normative context, how do we take this forward? If you're a development agency and you're committed to high level commitment on inclusiveness, for example, how do you actually work with the donors that are in the room? 
Coast of, of Huddersfield. Um, and so I was pleased to hear James talk about why our college students are not the same school that they are at home. And that turned over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on just a couple of things really briefly that have been said. Um, I, th I think how do one get enlightened leadership? This is that question about politics and political organization and political party. Because it's inevitable, you're quite right in the research to point out to the visionary, the role of visionary leadership, but it always fails. It's ephemeral. We know it. I've lived long enough now to, to see it over and over again. But where it can actually be become a part of a kind of impersonal authority, you know, uh, in, a, in the sense that North talks about it, is in political organizations. I mean, we, we saw it in the difference between those organizations that could achieve some resilience, even with poverty and, 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 and fragile ones. So political parties, I think, are, should be on the agenda of research, but also, I mean, I, I think, I hope that Africans reading this research might <laughs> put it on their own, their own agenda. Um, you know, the, the Allison said, um, why does maternal uh, health work and not agriculture in Rwanda. Um, well, in part, I would kind of second what Goloba said, that things are changing in agriculture in a very interesting way for the very same reasons that are being put forward here, that elites who, who, were, who, who were essentially coming from families that were in exile and not, did not have an, an interest in the power structures in the land. And so this, this state, I think, has moved with a land law with very interesting incentives in terms of changing production and, and introducing agribusiness. So, and, and exactly through the same prism, why is Rwanda so horribly poor in terms of implementing any property tax in urban areas? That's because that's the big elite giveaway. Mm -hmm. That's where, you know, you know the uh, elites are, are, are ha have quite a free reign on what seem to be, you know, important uh, perks. Um, that they're getting back the in the system. Very high. Yes, so they're getting, and, and, and maternal health doesn't step on anybody's toes, really. Everybody can go along with that. It's mm -hmm. not going to, to hurt rent. So I think the prism is really powerful for precisely answering mm -hmm. that, that those kind of questions. And just two other things. There is a, a comment and a m moment, which I think is really crucial because this is Africa-centered uh, research. Uh, a couple of comments about China. And, you know, you said the structural change is not just due to the China factor, but you see the China factor is the huge advantage that Africa has now, I think. A very important, we don't know it for sure yet, but the mm -hmm. potential investment flow that hasn't been there before, whether or not it's tapped in ways that promote developmental rents or, or, or non-developmental ones will depend on local on politics locally, but I, I really would like to challenge this sort of um, China as, as, uh, as threat or, you know, that's precisely a new source, not only Chinese investment coming, but production platforms for the first time. That's what we see in Ethiopia. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's still small, but it, it, it's a new possibility for, 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 for Africa. And then finally, I think the arm's length idea is great, but if anything, I see in the current donor community, I mean, Richard was very good at being arm's length, but nowadays, if we if research is anything to go by, I think that um, there's going to be not much arm's length as the golden thread <laughs> of David Cameron reaches its way into, into development. So that's going to be a very big challenge for people who are actually trying to, to to bring these kind of insights into the climate and the and the aid community today. Can I say, um, obviously, with my slightly generous, naive, ineffective head, and it's not about trying to be favorite, so unless David wants to say anything else, um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you very much to David, Fred, Richard, and all of their colleagues. I mean, this isn't just a typical seminar here. It is the culmination of five years of very hard work. Um, and they've provided us with, with an unbelievable, uh, unbelievably valued collection, valuable public good mm -hmm. as a result of their research. Um, if 
I can also say thank you very much for them for sort of for many things like being able to step in with my colleague and doing so much um, um, work there that I don't want to be promised that I'm not doing. I should say just like when I was there in assembly it was research and I think they must be masochists and because they keep ending research which is challenging <laughs> and that is so much <laughs> impressive and knowing that how because it's public service work that it enriches uh, all of us. So I mean David and First of all, we're, we, we are very grateful for, for all of the kind, wor <coughs> kind words and the critical comments that, uh, that we've heard to our two discussants, to, to Heather for taking the chair and for everybody who's uh, contributed around the table. We will take these thoughts away and we look forward to talking to you about future research and policy engagement activities uh, arising from, uh, from this meeting. Um, I hope you all join us for a, for a drink which I think is across the way. Anyway, somewhere it will be visible as soon as you walk out of the door. <laughs> Join us for a, draw, uh, for a drink. Thanks very much for coming, and uh, we look forward to uh, further discussions uh, arising from uh, these important tools. Thanks.